Hello and welcome to This Morning Africa with me, Green Ndume, on IFN TV. I'm sure you've heard and you've seen a couple of pictures that have been coming out of Libya, the very troubling images of African, uh, Africans who have been abused and, and sold into slavery in different categories. With me here in the studio is one of Ghana's most renowned security experts, Mr. Iribad Ibrahim, you welcome to the show. Green, thank pleasure you so much to for have you here. It's been, always been, a pleasure. The been last while, time been we did this was some four years absolutely, ago. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you're, looking, you're, looking, you're looking good. You're, you're looking dapper, perfect. you know. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you. So yeah. now, let's take a look at Libya and what's actually happened. Um, should, should we now all start crying that, oh, Gaddafi was put out of the out of power, and and most of us, most Africans, actually applaud and say, "Oh, he stayed in power for so long, and all that. He deserved to have gone." Are we, is a foul cry now? I think for so long, people from south of the Sahara, hardworking Nigerian young people, hardworking Ghanaians, Senegalese, have always used Libya as a conduit to reach Lampedusa in Italy. Mm. They did it 10 years ago, they did it 20 years ago, and they are doing it now. Mm. How come those who did it 10 years ago, when Gaddafi was there, why were they not sold into slavery? Mm. So therefore, in looking at this canker that is plaguing the continent today, we need to look at the raison d'etre, the very fundamental reason why we are where we are today. You know, when Gaddafi was accused of you know, threatening the people of Benghazi, during the Arab Spring that he was going to cleanse the city of Benghazi, some three key Western powers deceived the rest of the world. Mm. The United States, the UK, and France. They said they were going to impose a no-fly zone. So they went to the UN Security Council. They had a very convincing case, and therefore Russia and China abstained from vetoing that resolution. But Green, no-fly zone does not mean regime change. So they kept bombarding um, Libya until Gaddafi was captured and dehumanized and killed. And after that, his corpse was put out in the full glare of the public for people to file past his corpse to say this was the bad man. Mm. A continental hero had suddenly become a villain. So therefore, I believe uh, we need to um, lay the blame squarely on the military intervention that saw the violent toppling of the Gaddafi regime. But again, one would have thought that with the new regime, um, uh, probably because uh, it was, it was an, it, they, have, they have been put in place yeah. due to an uprising by yeah. the people, that yes. they could have been more people-oriented. Yes. But it seems there's a sharp shift from that. I think if you are to take a sample space, of maybe a hundred Libyans and ask them whether they regret ever conducting what was purely a rebellion, mm. but the world saw it as a revolution. Mm. I'm sure a good number of them will tell you the days of Gaddafi are better, were better than the days they are living today. It's a living hell to be in Libya currently. Libya has degenerated in terms of rule of law. Mm. There is complete lawlessness in the country. Mm. In fact, you can't put a finger on one government. There are parallel governments. There is one in Tripoli, there is one in Tobruk. People's throats are being slit. All of these didn't happen during the time of Gaddafi. But new colonialists, with their imperialist thoughts, tagged him as a, a dictator, an authoritarian, someone who didn't believe in liberties, someone who didn't believe in democracy. And therefore, there was this groundswell of disenchantment that was created, especially within the youth demographic. These same white folks gave them weapons to fight against their leader. Mm. So therefore, I believe anybody who looks at what is happening today would feel nostalgic. For the days Gaddafi could secure accommodation for every single Libyan. Mm. The days Gaddafi would give good health care to every Libyan. Mm. The days even people who came from Nigeria and Ghana could get lucrative jobs and do remittances back home. Those days, I believe, in the assessment of the Libyans themselves, were better days than the days they are living today. Did, did China and Russia betray Libya? Why did they betray Libya? Because you are saying that in places like Syria, they are refusing to give up. No, they learned from the Libyan mistake. You know, they were beguiled by the three you know, Western powers with permanent seats on the UN Security Council. That is why they have not budged 
in the case of Syria and other countries, because all they were told was that lives were at stake. Atrocious crimes could potentially be perpetrated against the people of Benghazi. Mm. So they okayed the imposition of a no-fly zone, and nothing more than that. Mm. So from a no-fly zone, uh, the Westerners kept bombing until they achieved regime change. And as we speak, unfortunately, as people die, Western powers are only interested in Libya's oil. They are siphoning oil, plundering and pillaging the country as innocent people get enslaved. So therefore, they shouldn't sit on any ivory tower of morality to say the AU should do something now, we should send relief items and all that. They created this mess and they should be blamed for it. But again, now, now that this mess has been created and what is the images that we are seeing coming yeah. out from Libya, the, 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 the West are not actually um, bearing the brunt of it. Everything is coming back to Africa. Shouldn't Africans, Africa, I mean, African leaders have taken much more responsibility in terms of um, ameliorating the Libyan crisis? I think from there's, there, yes, for so long the AU has been accused of being a toothless bulldog. Mm. An AU that cannot even put a roof over his head. What we, what we have in Addis Ababa as a headquarters was given to us by, by China. China. It's a shame. Uh, so therefore, yes, there's seeming lethargy and inertia on the part of our leaders. But I believe, fundamentally, Gaddafi's call for a central bank for the whole of Africa. Gaddafi's call that the dollar, which is legal tender for one country, Absolutely. should not be a currency for everybody in the world. Mm -hmm. We should use a common denominator like gold. These were the kind of things the white people didn't want. And therefore, they did all the machinations. They created this, you know, uh, sketch we are seeing in Libya currently. So therefore, as we have this discussion and do an introspection as Africans, let's not take our eyes off the ball. And the cause of this mess are the Western powers. But again, let's, let's look at another interesting perspective, the mm -hmm. fact that African leaders don't just want to leave power. We've seen the same scenario before Moy, Moy was put out of Kenya. Yes. We've seen the same scenario in different African, even in Ghana, for example, yes. there, are, there are allegations and Krumah didn't want to relinquish power. And that's why he was put out in Nigeria. Yeah. President Obasanjo tried to go for um, a third term. In Sierra Leone now, there's an ongoing crisis between the president and the vice president. The vice president has come out to accuse uh, Enes by Kuruma of, of having to, to uh, amend the constitution for a third term. This thing keeps lingering on. Isn't, isn't, is there, why, why is the African scenario like this? Is there a situation, is there a historical perspective to Green, this? Green, this is a loaded question. A few paragraphs cannot answer this question. You see, there has been this long-standing allegation that African leaders want to cling to power forever. Yes, it's true. Look at governors and, and senators in Nigeria. They say power corrupts, absolute absolutely. power corrupts, absolutely. absolutely. The convoys that come, the glitz and glamour, everything you want, you just snap your fingers and they get done, it gets done. So you can't live with not having those privileges. But again, is it the frequency with which we change governments on the continent that brings development? Ghana and Nigeria have changed governments more than most countries on this continent. Absolutely. But every intersection, every traffic light you hit in Lagos and Accra, you see street children, mm. young folks with exuberant energy selling dog chains. In Rwanda, Polkagami took over a war-torn country when the Tutsis and Hutus killed each Absolutely. other. He did two terms, and each term was seven years. After 14 years, the people said, no, you have an unfinished developmental job. We want you to continue. So therefore, even though the Constitution said no president should go beyond two terms, the people said, let's do a referendum. And overwhelmingly, they said the man should, should stay. So therefore, it's not about how often you change governments. Longevity sometimes leads to development. Look at Buhari's APC. Look at Nanadu's NPP. They all know that very soon they will have a test of their political survival. So your focus is how to win the next election. No longevity, no continuity in the, the developmental agenda because you are in a hurry. You are racing Absolutely, against but time. How, again, um, one would say that in other models in places like America and the UK and, and other places, yeah. uh, 
this model of, of, of um, a limited term for leadership is working. No. Why can't it work in Africa? A comparison of Africa with the U.S. and the U.K. is just like comparing oranges and apples. They are poles apart. Do you know in the U.K., the prime minister doesn't have too much power. It takes the decree of the queen to get things done. Why haven't they changed their queen? Since Namdi Azikiwe's time, since Nkrumah's time, we've known no queen but Queen Elizabeth. Why are they not changing her? Look at the Scandinavian countries. You have elections, but then the kinship, the royalty, those are the people that determine what happens in the country. Even in the U.S., during war times, there were presidents that did more than the two terms. So therefore, I, as circumstance is idiosyncratic. Our circumstance is unique and peculiar. And therefore, we can't have a straight jacket that what has worked in the U.K. should work here. There isn't enough time for people to plan the developmental agenda. And therefore, for me, it's not about how often we change Mr. Iribar, we'll, we'll take a short commercial break. We'll be right back. Africa with me, Green Dume on IFN TV. This morning, Africa is Africa's uh, morning show, a tea break show where we take a run about Africa to give you the current issues that are um, taking place on the continent. With me this morning remains Iribad Ibrahim. You're welcome back to the Thank show. Thank you so much, Mr. Green. Iribad. Now, what does the Libyan situation um, yeah. pertain for? The West African subregion, which is a very volatile, one of the most volatile parts of the subcontinent. I think for anybody who carries out that perilous voyage, whether from Nigeria or Ghana, you move through Agadez in Niger before you hit the Sahara Desert. But as we speak, Al Qaeda has got operations in the Sahel. So AQIM, Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, right. is active over there. ISIS also is active in the area. Nigeria still has the lingering problem of Boko Haram as a militant organization. So therefore, the carnage in Libya and its instability only creates a conducive enabling environment for weapons to come into the Sahel and the West African sub-region. That is how come countries that before now were immune from militant attacks have suffered. Burkina Faso has been attacked. La Cote d'Ivoire has been attacked. So therefore, Libya is a huge mess. And this continent, unfortunately, and especially this sub-region, is going to live with the unintended consequences of the violent toppling of Gaddafi for many years to come. Instead of looking at the reactionary consequences that are coming out of this scenario, yeah. let, let's take a look at the, um, um, the, the sort of the... Um, for lack of a better word, the, the results, the plans that we could put in place to um, solve this problem. Yeah. How is it that African leaders cannot solve the problem that is pushing people to Libya, pushing young people, thousands of young people to Libya? Why is it that we cannot solve or provide an enabling environment where young people, for example, can come out of the university, start a business, and it grows? I feel abashed as a young leader on this continent when I'm invited by fellow young people to speak at universities. Then we keep telling them 21 laws of starting up a business, 10 laws of being an entrepreneur. 
when the Nigerian government has no startup capital for people that are mm -hmm. just coming out of college, mm -hmm. when the Ghanaian or the Gambian or the Sierra Leonean government does not have any plans for people. So therefore, the youth south of the Sahara feel let down by our leaders. Mm -hmm. It is because of lack that a pregnant girl in her teens would want to be in a dinghy, a boat that is wavering, as and when the waves, you know, come around. Wow. And they, they want to get out of this continent. It's because of the failure and dysfunction of leadership. So therefore, anybody who is okay, you leave your house only there is, when there is a need. So therefore, I believe the buck stops with our leaders within the sub-region. But one would say that there are people, young people, on, on, cutting across the, all countries on, on, of this continent, including mm -hmm. places like Somalia, who are actually in their countries and doing well, not living to put themselves at the peril of, yeah. of being sold into slavery, like yeah. what they have in Libya. That yeah. part of the argument is also there. Now, anybody who has not had the opportunity to live is a direct beneficiary of the decadence. No cock pastor or corrupt politician will tell you things are not going on well. But for those people that are hard working, today on this, sub on this continent, when you are semi-literate, you are in trouble because governments don't provide any jobs, no support system. When you go to the university, even in Ghana, quite unfortunately, there is an association called Association for Unemployed Graduates. Interesting. That is how far we have gotten in this youth despondency. So that youth bulge we are seeing does not have a correlational burgeoning creation of job opportunities. Mm -hmm. Look at the number of people who queue at the Hungarian embassy, the Czech embassy, countries you would have looked down upon the time we got independence. Mm -hmm. And I'll share this anecdote with you, Green. About a fortnight ago, Her Royal Highness of Denmark came to Ghana. Mm -hmm. And when she came and parlayed with her president. She said she was bringing an apology from Denmark to say for, sorry for, 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 slave for slave trade. You know what some of our young people were saying on social media? They said, Madam, don't waste time. Just bring another <laughs> Danish ship. Bring another Danish ship and see how many people will be aboard the ship to go into Denmark. So people actually want to be voluntarily exactly. sold to slavery. Exactly. Why? Because of the dysfunction and failure of our leaders. We are talking about Sani Abacha, and they say Sani Abacha stashed away hundreds of millions of dollars. He is dead and gone. This cash is in an, an offshore account. How does Africa stand to benefit? We don't want to speak ill of the dead, but I believe there is nobody to blame except the dysfunction Mr. of Irbad, what, within the sub -region. What is the immediate solution to stopping young people from going to Libya and being sold into slavery? I think this program is one of the um, ad hoc measures we can adopt uh, to tell the people the realities out there. Sometimes not only Libya, Gulf countries like Kuwait, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, mm. young Nigerians and Ghanaians and Gambians or Sierra Leoneans are promised good salary uh, for working for cleaning, doing cleaning Many in their jobs, house, menial jobs. Uh, menial jobs. And sometimes when they get the so-called travel agents who are in earnest, human traffickers, take away their passports and give them a pittance mm. from what they are paid. Some are raped, some never get the opportunity to come back, come home. back home. So therefore, I believe that creating awareness and people who are masquerading as travel agents who are human traffickers should be named and shamed as well. Mm. Anytime we travel out of this country, you get to an international airport, you see people who can't even write their names. Someone is filling the immigration forms for them. The person is prodding them to take a lurch into the unknown. So therefore, would you be comfortable if that were your cousin? Would you be comfortable if the person you are taking there were your daughter? And so therefore, I believe morality alone should tell us that, yes, all hands should be on deck as various interstate agencies work. You don't get to Libya until you pass through certain countries from Nigeria and Ghana. Absolutely. So, so how are the structures that have been put in place to stop Interpol, them from even moving? Exactly. Because even as we speak now, people are leaving. No, despite This second, some people have packed their backpacks. They are going to Libya. So therefore, how do we get Interpol? 
how do we get the intelligence sharing between these countries within the West African sub-region to share intel about the people who are crossing the borders and the porosity of the borders, of the borders across West Africa? That's another big problem. Ghana yeah. is a small country, but it has got up to 42 approved and unapproved entry points. So, and when you get to a border post, see how ill-prepared, ill-equipped, ill-remunerated our border guards are. There can be only one pickup car that is crisscrossing hundreds of kilometers. It means we are not serious. No CCTV cameras, nothing. You just give some bribe, then you cross the border. So people are being trafficked. So I believe this should be a multi-pronged approach. There should be an interagency co collaboration so that anybody who travels on a certain passport and you don't know what the person is going to do, the person doesn't have the skill set uh, to travel, those countries can be helpful by duly repatriating some of our young ones to is the various there, countries. Is there, is there a from. future we should be looking forward to uh, in Libya, for example? Are we seeing... Are we seeing um, um, the end of what is I mean, actually transparent. You know, when people are profiting from carnage, it becomes difficult, it becomes to, difficult to resolve it. You see the oil the white folks are siphoning. If there is a functional government, the people will say no. Mm. They'll say we want to nationalize our national resource. Mm. Then Italy, that was a former colonial master, and played a key role in the top line of Gaddafi, Gaddafi will not benefit any longer. So I don't see any sense of urgency. When Russia and Ukraine, or when the people of Ukraine fight, in a matter of days, then there is a declaration of cessation of hostilities, or ceasefire. But when Africans are dying, everybody looks the other way. In Togo, see the people that are dying. In Nigeria, look at the people that are dying. In Libya, see the people that are dying. In DR Congo, in the Central African Republic, is it that the blood of the African is not as worthy as the blood of people of other race, okay. other races? These are food. This is food for thought for us. Okay. And the white folks, nobody can solve your problem better than you. So we should win ourselves. We say Africa has been emancipated. We've gained independence, but we are still tied to the umbilical cords of our former colonial masters. So everybody, it's been a wonderful opportunity to have you on the show. I'm, I'm sure we are going to bring you back to the studio again. This conversation is just like it shouldn't end. Okay. Thank you so much. You're most welcome, around. Green. The pleasure is mine. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. So it's been a wonderful opportunity with Mr. Iribad Ibrahim. We cross over now to Serafina Dedu, who has a report on um, Okada riding in Accra, Ghana, Ghana's capital that Okada is, is almost taking over. We go for a short commercial break. We'll be right back. Motorcycles, popularly known as Okada, a Nigerian coinage, has finally defined its name officially in Ghana's capital, Accra. We're here live at Circle, a popular part of Accra, Ghana. Commercial motorcycle riders have taken over the city. This art is illegal and we're here to find out why they've resorted to the streets despite being frowned out by the law. Uh, first of all, if I may say, uh, because there is no job and there is no companies around that we can go and find a job. That is the reason why we find ourselves in this business. Oh, the police people, they, they are warriors. They are warriors because we don't get any work. And this work 
we are taking care of is your, our family and everything. But police people, if they catch us, oh, they for take some small money or they for take us go police station do what we want to do. But they go waste our time. They go waste our time uh, before they go court. They go take money. The family too is in the house. You can't stay in the house whereby the family too will be going hunger. So you have to come out the street and then find something to go and give it to the children in the house. Sometimes police people tell us hey, you should not wear a man. But you see police people, you, you ride moto, no man, no normal plate. But if me, I ride, you catch me. You understand? Uh -huh. So government for do something. I, I hope Akufuado if for do something, give us. You understand? Uh -huh. So they for do something, give us. We play. We, they say they will we carry you to court. They will carry you to court. They will take court. Yeah. They will take court. 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 They will if it's still, we go, we go still, because yeah. nowhere. Welcome back. Thank you, Serafina, for that story. We've also tried to reach the Motor Transport and Traffic Directorate of the Ghana Police Service to get their reaction to this story by Serafina Dedu, but um, that effort is yet to yield uh, fruits. We are trying to uh, make that call, but as long as we, uh, the moment we are, are able to get in touch with the appropriate people to speak to at the Motor Transport and Traffic Directorate. We'll bring them on the show. Thank you. And now to the next story, Chidima Uku takes a look at waste disposal within beach communities in Ghana. Take a look at this story. We'll be right back. of African countries are currently suffering from serious environmental degradation. Pollution, deforestation, erosion and desert encroachment are constantly putting a threat to the existence of humanity. Once serene and leisure places like this beach here in Ghana's capital Accra that once served as a melting pot for the pleasure of friends and family have been turned into waste hubs. Some of these environmental degradation and hazards are caused by nature, but human involvement has been identified as the largest contributor to this troubling environmental trend. Improper means of disposing household waste have constituted in the pollution of areas around Ghanaian water bodies. The rate of environmental degradation and pollution in Ghana especially on the Ghanaian water bodies, is becoming extremely alarming. It has been recorded that Ghana is losing over 12% of her GDP to environmental degradation. Right now, we are on the beach behind the Independence Square here in Accra. This beach is called Bola Beach. Bola, which stands for dirt. This place has become a dumping ground for trash. This place is actually meant to be creating wealth for the nation. What do you think is a problem? Trash is a problem. I am Chidi Maupu for IFN TV. I often come here to train, mostly on, on weekends. And then the surroundings is not really good. Beans are mostly being dropped here. And then you see people with animals, pigs, a whole lot of things, broken bottles. And sometimes when, I'm not the only footballer who trains here. A lot of people train here. And then it affects us. Sometimes you can even be just jogging around and then you get cut by a broken bottle. I go she. Near to Lago, 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 Lago. So always the dirty, the dirty, the Pegasus way of doing that are living in areas. They used to put it inside the Lago. So the Lago too would draw to bring it inside sea. And after the sea too, sea too no like dirty. So always when the, when the dirty go to the inside sea, then the sea too drop it inside down. Bring it all the, the rubbish all from outside. 
Jamestown is the oldest district in the city of Accra, Ghana. This area was heavily developed by the end of the 19th century and following the rapid growth of the city during the 20th century, they became areas of a dense mixture of commercial and residential use. But today, Jamestown remains a fishing community inhabited primarily by the Ga, and now in a state of decay following years of neglect by subsequent governments. The district has, however, become a popular tourist destination for those seeking to see the remnants of Accra's colonial past. I always come here just to come and help the fishermen who are my brothers and sisters here in fishing. It's not my prof uh, pro uh, professional work. But I do always come here. Uh, when you look around my back, there are a lot of rubbish here. Now, this rubbish which have been gathered behind me come from all the way from a uh, circle, Aveno to circle and then down to this side. Now, one may ask, what, what is the origin of these uh, plastics? Now, they are coming from Alajo, Alajo down to circle, then to Odona, Odona then to the seaside. Everything in nature is ultimately linked to each other. And so for this singular reason, we should never forget that polluted water can also enter drinking water supply systems and can be hazardous to our health. Hey, welcome back. It's been an exciting morning to have you here on This Morning Africa in our studio live in Accra, Ghana. It's been a very, very wonderful opportunity to have all of you hooked onto your screen from the beginning of the show to the end. Thank you so much for watching from the producers and all members of the crew. Thank you so much. See you again tomorrow. My name is Green Ndume.